About 41 years ago, brother, the late brother Thomas Warren came out with a little booklet that he used in his classes called A Time for Sound Doctrine and a Day of Liberalism. In this little booklet, he discusses some of the rudimentary fundamentals, uh, if you want to call it that, of just what error he means in liberalism. And in chapter number 12, he talks about the power of God's Word. In doing so, he gives quite a list of all those things that have to do with being in opposition to the truth, to the gospel, to the church. I want to just read these. Each one can almost be a text for a sermon. But I want to read these to you by way of introduction to what we're going to deal with here today. He points out another thing we must, we must do is believe devoutly in the power of God's Word to be a dynamic force in our world today. It is the practice of modernists to praise those who are not polemic. That means debaters. That is, to praise those who never criticize or condemn any doctrine, no matter how far from the truth a given doctrine may be, but who are, quote, tolerant, unquote, of practically any and every doctrine. In contrast to this insipid viewpoint, and I'm quoting, the Bible warns against false prophets, Matthew 24, 24 through 26, grievous wolves who speak perverse things, Acts 20, 29, 31, false apostles, 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15, those who by slight of men in craftiness seek to carry men about by every wind of doctrine after the wiles of error, Ephesians 4.14. Those who pervert the gospel, Galatians 1, 6 through 9. False prophets who bring in destructive heresies, 2 Peter 2 and verse 1. Those who teach the doctrines of demons, 1 Timothy 4 and verses 1 through 5. Those who teach fables, 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. False prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves, Matthew 5, 15. False prophets, deceitful workers, who try to make themselves appear to the, uh, be apostles of Christ who are really ministers of Satan, 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 through 16. And those who do not walk by the same rule, he has in parenthesis, the gospel, and thus who are enemies of the cause of Christ and whose end is perdition, Philippians 3, 15 through 19. John commends those who could not bear evil men and who tried them who call themselves apostles and they are not. Revelation 2, 2. Paul and Jesus both taught that those who believe a lie, false doctrine, would be damned. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 through 12. Mark 16, 15 and 16. God's people are taught to stand fast in the faith. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. To contend earnestly for the faith. Jude 3. And to be set for the defense of the gospel. Philippians 1, 16. To be ready always to give an answer, and that means defend, concerning the hope we have, 1 Peter 3.15. In order to be free from sin, we must both know and walk in the truth, John 8.32 and 2 John 1 verse 7. All religious teachers are to be tested in the light of the scriptures, 1 John 4.1, Acts 17.11. Because many such teachers are false teachers. After a first and second admonition, factious men, heretics, teachers of false doctrine, ought to be refused. Titus 3, 10 and 11. And then he says, so false doctrine is to be condemned and false teachers to be rejected. He further emphasizes, this helps us to see the great value of truth and of teachers of truth in God's scheme of things. 
God intends, he continues on, that the gospel should be regarded by his people as his power unto salvation. Thus, we must regard it as the, and he emphasizes that, dynamic force to change the world, to change men who are rebellious sinners to men who are sons of God, dedicated to truth and righteousness. He says in connection with this point, I must admit that there is a gigantic amount of evil in the world today, that there is a growing tendency toward anarchy, toward utter contempt for law and authority, and that there is growing indifference toward and contempt for religion. And I've had that for 40 years, and that puts it at a time in my life when I was still forming a great many things. I don't quote him because he is the final authority. You will notice that what he wrote had book, chapter, and verse behind it. I wanted to read what he said simply because he listed one after the other all the many accounts that are in the Bible warning the church against false teachers, false doctrine, and the obligation of members of the church to stand up and be counted when they need to. Sometimes I think we read one here, we run there, we hear a sermon on this, we hear a sermon on that. We don't realize how much the New Testament of Christ warned, taught, urged, commanded, every way it could be said that you must be careful about what you believe, who teaches what. James spends a great deal of time on who should be a teacher of the gospel and who should not and points out clearly that those who teach those things, that uh, we shall receive the greater condemnation. And that means what we allow to teach and who we allow to influence this congregation. That means my life and your life. We are what we think, and we think what we're taught. And if we've been taught error, we think error, and we live error. That's just the way that it works. Let me notice some scriptures further, and I want you to notice that two of these were written particularly to young preachers, for them to know for their own good, but also that they would teach it to others. That's a very important point to keep in mind. It's interesting that as he closes the last few words of the first letter Paul wrote to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6, Notice how he closes this letter to him. And remember the deep attachment there was with Paul and Timothy. How Paul considered him as the person who had no one else compared to in the like-mindedness of Timothy and Paul. Paul's an older man. Timothy's a younger man. Notice what he says. O oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Now listen. Avoid profane and vain babblings. And oppositions of science falsely so-called. Science means knowledge. So he's saying there is a knowledge that stands in opposition to the truth of the gospel. Then he says, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. That is the New Testament system of salvation, the gospel. And then he says, grace be with thee. Amen. Interesting that the last thing he has to say to Timothy, you be so very careful what influences you, and here's what to oppose and turn away from it, and let it not have anything bearing on you. But Titus is another young man who preaches the gospel. He says virtually the same thing to him in Titus 1 verse 14. Not giving heed to Jewish fables, and commandments of men. Well, what kind of fables and commandments of men? That turn from the truth. Remember, Jesus said, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31 and 32. Jesus prayed, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. And Paul said, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. But then he tells us why. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Sound there means wholesome teaching. Well, you know, 
if you give up the gospel system, you can't go anywhere but to false doctrine when it comes to salvation. So these points, I think, are well laid out in the Bible as to the responsibility of everybody that's faithful in the church, their various capacities of service, must have in mind. But I picked up another book that was very valuable some years ago. I think it's the, the uh, copyright's 2000. It's called Truth Decay. And at the very beginning of it, this man says, uh, it, uh, however, it is another kind of problem to believe that truth itself is merely a matter of personal belief and social custom, so that the truth about Jesus depends on who you take him to be. In this case, no amount of evidence or argument about particular matters of fact will change one's belief. And that's getting in the nature of truth. Does our environment determine what the truth is? And if you're in a different environment, the truth changes? That just doesn't make any sense at all, but there's a lot of things in the world that don't make any sense at all. If you look further into this book, and I won't attempt to go further than that, he will spend a great deal of time on the matter of people believing that culture determines what's right and what's wrong. So, further by introduction, I simply pose the question for our consideration through the rest of this sermon, is custom the final authority for determining morals? Let me hasten to answer in the beginning, it absolutely is not. Anybody that believes and practices that can't go to heaven. If the custom in the United States was for women in public to wear no clothing from the waist up, does the New Testament authorize the Christian woman, we could say female, to conduct herself according to that particular custom? Well, for a person to answer yes to the foregoing question, then that person, whether they realize it or not, and they all realize it, is affirming the proposition, custom is the final authority for determining moral actions. I'd like to see anybody here want to stand up and say, that's the way it is. It may be easy to say it somewhere else, but I suggest if you're bold enough to influence people somewhere else in private, you ought to be bold enough to stand up for it publicly. No matter the person answering yes to this question, whether he realizes it or not, or she as the case may be, that person is a moral relativist, period. Oh, but I only apply this to one area. You can't do that. If, the, if custom is the final authority of determining morals, that means all moral activity. You can't pick and choose, well, that suits me here, it works well with me here. No, it fits everybody. If it's the truth, it fits everybody. And it saddens me, and as Paul said twice to the elders at Ephesus, he served night and day with tears. To say that certain members of the Lord's church spring believe such a false and damnable doctrine. That's a shame and disgrace in this church to begin with after all that's been taught. It is a cancer eating in the body of Christ. Brother Buddy, when you found out you had cancer and they said it was stage one, you decided to wait to fight it when it got to stage three. Ken's an accountant. If there's a hundred dollar mistake in your uh, uh, whatever your tally sheet is, you say, well, that's no bad thing. Let's just let it alone. You wouldn't do that at all. I remember my mother worked as a bookkeeper for Washita Valley Dairy in which she had to check all of the milk drivers out with whatever product they had. And then when they came back in, she had to check them back in, and the money they brought in had to match up with the stuff they didn't have, for that should have been sold. And she has worked many days for an hour to find a penny. It works that way. You just don't say, well, here, let me put a nickel in. That'll cover it. I don't think that's good accounting practice. And if we can be that concerned about matters of this world, what about the spiritual body of Christ and the members in particular? I do not think that I frustrate the Word of God or anybody that loves the truth of the Bible by doing that. 
In this sermon, I'll answer the question, is God's moral standard for mankind relative to the environment of the individual? That states it more formally. Is God's moral standard for mankind relative to the environment of the individual? I read Brother Warren's material here because this that's 40 one years ago, some of us just haven't started yesterday to cut our teeth on this matter. I haven't heard anybody make any kind of argument to try to talk about uh, moral relativism being the only way to go. I just haven't heard it that's impressed me at all. I haven't heard anything new. Because there is nothing new out there. Well, let's begin by defining what moral relativism is. Moral relativism... That is the view that custom is the final authority in determine morals. Moral relativism is the view that moral or ethical statements, which vary from person to person, are all equally valid, and no one's opinion of right and wrong is really better than any other. That's it. Moral relativism is a broader, more personally applied form of other types of relativistic thinking. And one of them is called cultural relativism. I wonder where somebody came up with that idea and thought they ought to list it. These are all based on the idea that there's no ultimate standard of good or evil. So every judgment about right and wrong is purely a product of a person's preferences and usually that's based upon their environment or preferences and their environment. There's no ultimate standard of morality according to moral relativism. And no statement or position can be considered absolutely right or wrong, best or worst. I need not tell this audience that moral relativism is a widely held position in this world today. Though it's um, very selectively applied. As with other forms, and there are, for sake of classification, forms of relativism, it's only mentioned in a purely defensive way. Now let me point that out. The principles of moral relativism can only be used to excuse or allow certain actions. Did you get that? Have, have the great thinkers among us, I mean the profound gray matter workers, have they not realized that every time you bring up moral relativism, you're trying to justify an action? You're trying to justify what you're doing. Now, you go get your head in the books that get into this in a way, way and you'll see that's what it is. The moral relativistic principles can never be used to condemn things. They're only used to permit something. And I promise you what they're seeking to permit is not authorized by the Bible. Moral relativism takes several forms, and I'm not about to go into a study of all the utilitarianism and evolutionism and existentialism and emotivism and situationism, but all these forms, for the most part, share a single unifying theme that absolute morals do not exist. And what is right or wrong is entirely a product of human preference. Now somebody may say, well, you're quoting me out of context. Brethren, there is no context on this earth that will justify that statement. When you make a statement, a statement is a sentence that makes a claim. Or it's not a statement. And when you say that God's order, God's moral order for mankind is relative to the environment of the individual, just think what you've done. Tell me a context that would make that statement right. You can't do it. I'd be glad to give somebody, if they think they've grown to that position, a good while to stand up and say, and I'm just going to show you, you've taken me out of context. I haven't taken anybody out of context. That's the very point of a true-false proposition. It follows the rule of the excluded middle. There's no middle ground. It's true or it's false. And no context changes it. So when people start that kind of stuff, a few of us have been around long enough, no, that won't work either. Moral relativism. Is there a fixed standard? 
Well, it's easy to see that the foundation of moral civilization, modern civilization, I should say, were not built on a philosophy of moral relativism. Now, I'm appealing just to what's going on and kept things done decently in order in every facet of a society. The very act of passing a law and enforcing it suggests a fixed standard and everyone's expected to adhere to it. The reasons, I think, are quite obvious. If anyone in a society really, truly acted as though right and wrong were merely matters of opinion, then society would implode into a battle of might makes right. And usually the government's going to be the one that settles it as to what's right and wrong when you take that position because they're about the most powerful folks there are. In morally relativistic culture, the only universal reason to do or not do anything is to avoid the consequences from one's peers. All human laws involve some moral principle being enforced by threat of consequences. Speed limits are enforced on most roads because of a moral conviction that risking other people's lives is wrong. That's an amazing conclusion to come to. The same is true for murder, theft, perjury, fraud, and on down the line. When moral relativism becomes dominant, however, legitimate moral principles are no longer the foundation of those laws. Since everything is relative, then these laws are just a matter of opinion, and the only universal reason to follow them is simply to avoid the consequences. This strongly encourages people to look for ways to get away with it. After all, it's just one person's opinion against someone else's opinion. Even in society who, that operates, of course, under a rule of law, severing the connection between those laws and objective standard invites disaster. Now let me pause here and say, most people in this room are very upset the way the powers that be are leaving a static standard of truth called the Constitution to get what they want. They're pragmatists. Whatever truth is, whatever works. Well, the Bible doesn't condone that, and I can't condone it, because the Bible, God's Word, doesn't condone it. It condemns it. Well, I wish we could transfer some of that same concern to what's going on in this nation economically and in government down to the spiritual body of Christ, that Christ died and shed his blood for this church more important than Washington or anything else, or your bank account, or your friends, or your family. Because that's the only institution on this earth that's going to heaven. Only institution of the saved. The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved, Acts 2.47. Now you find, according to the Bible, you find saved people outside the church. They're not there. I don't care what anybody else says. The Lord has his church. He built it, Matthew 16, in Acts 2. 16, 18, and Acts 2. He purchased with his blood, Acts 20, verse 28. He adds every person who obeys the gospel and is baptized for the remission of sins to that church, Acts 2, 47. There are no saved people outside of the church of Christ as that terminology is used and defined in the Bible. And that makes it a pretty important institution. At best, moral relativism makes a society unstable as the concepts of right and wrong suddenly become a question of shifting popular opinions. The worst possible outcome of such a condition is the dictator. Did I tell you maybe what some people would like to do in uh, setting aside the Constitution and the laws derived therefrom? Wouldn't be the first time in history, would it? A ruler who abuses a temporary swing in popular opinion to seize power, but seize no authority as superior to his own, and no laws more binding than his own. Well, that's the motto of every dictator that ever came on the scene. During the Nuremberg trials after World War II, the logical problem of relativism became apparent. Nazi defendants continually pled for their acquittal, saying that they were only following the laws of the land, and really, in a state of frustration, one judge finally asked, But is there no law higher than our law? 
And a moral relativist would be forced by his own belief and logical thinking from those premises to answer, no. Well, I'd hate to know that there's no law higher than the laws men make. Relativism in and of itself is self-defeating. That's the reason it just, I just don't understand members of the church who've been members for years will say that, well, custom's a final authority in any moral matter. Where, where have people been? What did they do with their minds? What has the mind of Christ done for their minds? How could anybody hold that position? Logically, there must be some standard by which to compare two different moral statements to determine which is the more correct one. Obviously, more relativists deny that such a standard exists. And so they claim that such comparisons are impossible. And this results in the biggest practical problem of relativism. And we just mentioned it. It's difficult, if not impossible, to condemn any actions from a stance of moral relativism. And you know what it comes down to? It's wrong if I don't like it. <laughs> That's okay. It's wrong if um, it's different from the way I do it or my family does it or whatever else. Once right and wrong are relegated to matters of opinion at worst or are purely subjective at best, any talk of morality becomes incoherent. How in the world are you going to discuss what's right and wrong if somebody says, well, it's just a matter of customs? How are you going to do it? It's not my custom. It was, it was a matter of customs before Adam and Eve sinned because they're the only ones that set the custom. No other human beings on this earth. So when men were sinless, man and woman, husband and wife, went around naked. So there's their custom. So we become Christians. We're covered by the blood of Christ. Guess what we can do now that we're innocent again? We can all run around naked as little jaybirds. That's pretty naked. Brethren, some of the thinking that goes on just cannot be called thinking. It may be an effort to justify one's own proud, arrogant attitude and ignoramuses, but it's not real thinking. Cultural differences and upbringing do play a part from the standpoint of respecting the laws of God. Now, I won't have time to do this. I think I'll do it this afternoon. I want to show you something about just how cultural conduct has a bearing on things. Now, that's the teaser. You've got to come back this afternoon to get the rest of it. But how about reading 1 Corinthians 11, and you're going to see exactly what we're talking about. It's not that difficult. Suffice it to say, and I think we've proven it, to have a member of the church who believes this clap trap stuff and will argue his case and we sit by and let that go on, brethren. And you're right. And when we do, that action itself is sin. Now, we can sit there and play tiddlywinks all we want. It just simply comes down to that. And if not, you tell me what it is. So we'll look at some of this as time goes on. If I'm still permitted to get up here. And we'll do that. Are you a Christian today? Then you can become one by just doing what you please or doing nothing. And I think that's pretty standard throughout the whole denomination of the world. Just sort of think about your sins and think about God and His love for you and say, Jesus is my Savior. Or now, if you want to, if you'll feel better about this, then... You can believe in Christ and repent of your sins. But now, if you'd rather do more than that, you can stop there if you want to. But if you'd rather do more than that, then you can believe, repent, or you can confess your faith in Christ. Now, for those who are really sticklers, you might want to believe the gospel, believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ, and be baptized for the remission of sin. Take your choice. Brethren, you believe that? How long would you tolerate me? Well, you know, even when I preach the truth, I don't know how long you tolerate me. But how long would you tolerate me by teaching that as a way of salvation? You wouldn't. But it is amazing what we'll tolerate in other folks of our brethren. 
For what reason, I don't know. I just know it. Listen, it can't be justified by the authority of God's Word. It cannot be. And I challenge any man to do it. I don't care who you are. You can't do it. We ought to have authority from the New Testament behind all we believe in practice. All we believe in practice. But if you become a Christian, you absolutely must, on the basis of the teaching of the Bible, right and divided, believe that Christ is the Son of God. Repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized for the remission of sins. And you can't become a Christian unless you do that. If you're a child of God and you sin, then the Bible says you must repent of those sins and come confessing them. In private, not only you and God take care of it that way, but in public, then you need to come before the church and actually make a confession of your sins and mean it. All right, sit down there until you're ready to do that, because if you make any other kind of confession, it won't matter to anything anyway. As far as God's concerned, the forgiveness of your sins. But are you subject to the Lord's invitation? And if I were dead on the door now, right now, would it change the truth I preached this morning? You better think on these things. You don't know whether you'll see this afternoon or not. None of us do. If you're subject to the invitation of the Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.